Hello and welcome to your Experiment 2 post-practical lecture. Of course, in these post-practical lectures, we will always cover the report writing aspect of the experiment and give you general hints and tips on what we expect in a report, as well as answering some of the questions and helping you work through the data analysis, etc. So, uh, what are we looking for exactly in experiment two? So firstly, let's recall what did we look at. We looked at the kinetics for a specific reaction, and then we want to determine the thermodynamic parameters like the entropy, the enthalpy, the Gibbs free energy from the data that we collected during that experiment. And we require you to write or give, provide a title um, give the results section, a discussion section, answer some discussion question, and give references for this specific report. Uh, starting with the title, asking a question of what does a good title uh, entail? Usually a good title has around about less than 15 words, um, 12 to 15 words, no more. There's not a really strict rule. And it covers the main concepts of an experiment. However, it must be able to convey in a creative manner what exactly was done. So in other words, like how would you explain it to someone who did not do the experiment quickly in one sentence, what was done? So creative, but not informal, if I can put it that way. Um, try to convey as much information as possible with this um, without it being a whole paragraph. Uh, that's why we're trying to limit it to 15 words. So saying that for this, this, this title, for example, must contain all the, the, most, the, the most important keywords. So you have the specific reaction, which was per sulfate with iodide, and it was a kinetic experiment with thermodynamic parameters. So those words need to appear somewhere in your title, in some combination. I would love to give you ideas. And unfortunately, if I give an idea, I know everybody is going to use the same title. And that also wouldn't be fair. Um, that is why we say you're not allowed to copy from the manual. That's also why the manual titles are really boring and bland. It's to try to give you as much creative freedom and to give you as many options as possible. Um, like I say, some good advice is summarize. Try to summarize what the experiment was about. And essentially, if you struggle with it, maybe you, that's uh, part of it is you did not completely understand the experiment. And that is where the rest of this post-practical lecture will hopefully help you to understand the experiment a bit more. Okay, so that's the title. Of course, always use the report writing guide also to inspire you to help you give a good title for your report. Um, that's the main idea. So just to summarize, run about 15 words, pop less if it works, and use the main keywords in the title. That's always a good idea. Okay, so your results section. And generally, your results section contains a bunch of tables with data, all your equations, your reactions, your working outs, that kind of, um, I wouldn't say nonsense, but it's really relevant information, um, anything like that. So that's why you always see the tables and the equations listed in the results section. But also you need to always keep the connection with why the experiment was done, and that will guide you through your results section. So in this experiment, we want to see what the effect of temperature was on the rate of a given reaction. Because remember, temperature is really the only variable that influences the rate of the new reaction. And specifically, the reaction that we're looking at is that of per sulfate with iodine ions to form iodide and sulfate ions. That is a solid, and of course, that is aqueous iron. And now, this table that you will encounter should be this one. It's actually the one you filled in in the lab, and it's also the first table in your report sheet. And you will populate it from table 2.3. You will be able to calculate these initial concentrations of these two species 
in each of these columns. And these times are what you measured in the lab, right? So in other words, for each of these different concentrations, um, you will have a specific time it took at uh, the different concentration or the different temperatures. And we will, we will determine um, a bunch of thermodynamic parameters from this information. Now, to determine the thermodynamic parameters, we first need to ask ourselves what the reaction order is. And to get the reaction order, we use equation 2.10. And equation 2.10 might seem a bit nonsensical at first. And that is why I provide you with these two sub-equations, 2.10a uh, and 2.10b. Essentially, what this is, is a method of um, keeping one thing constant and changing one variable, and then keeping that variable constant and then changing the other variable. And we will upload an example, a simplified example of this for you to use as a guide. But essentially what it means is we're looking at, so remember you had reaction mixtures one, two, three, four, and five. So there should be reaction mixtures where the iodine concentration is the same. So let's say for example, the iodine mixture is the same for reaction one and three, but then the per sulfate in the concentration changes between one and three. Then you can use that reaction equations information to calculate um, this, these values. Um, similarly, so in other words, the time. So you take the time it took for it at a specific temperature to or the time of the reaction divided by the time of the second reaction and then the concentrations, as well as for the other option. So this time we're looking for reaction mixtures where the iodine concentration changed, but the per sulfate concentration remained the same. I know the subscripts one and two make it seem like you use the same reaction mixtures, but you do not. These are, these are different reaction mixtures. This can be one and four, and that can be three and five, for example. You need to identify the ones where the one concentration remains the same and the one changes. Okay. And if you do that correctly, you should get that M is equal to N. In fact, it should be equal to one, because this is a first order reaction. Okay, which is important for the next step in the data analysis. Because it's a first order reaction, the type of plot that you will do to obtain your rate constant is a plot with a very intense expression, which essentially is just this. And from this plot where you have that versus the times, so remember, Again, you will plug in A, B, C. C you can also get from table 2.3 to just calculate the concentration of this ion. And you plug it in there. And you get a specific dot associated with a specific time. And you'll have one for each temperature. Remember, you had three temperatures, 25, 40, and 60. And remember, these temperatures won't be fixed. They will be slightly different the day in the lab. So it might be 38 degrees, it might be 43, it might be 62, so just work with the specific temperature that you get in the lab on the day. So you have three graphs, each with this kind of slope, and you'll have a rate constant at each temperature. Because remember, rate constant is a function of only temperature. That rate constant is going to have a specific unit. Okay. And that essentially is what why we went through the whole hoo-ha of trying to first get the order so if you know that you plot a first order graph, I was telling you now you need to plot a first order graph, and then you plot the three graphs at each temperature so that you can get K. Now that we have K values, and we have a K value associated with a specific temperature value, so we have a K value at 25 degrees, we have a K value at 40 degrees, we have a K value at 60 degrees. You put it into table three, and you say temperature, so you have temperature, remember in Kelvin, so I've been speaking in degrees Celsius, but you work in Kelvin. You have your rate constant, and then you take ln of K, so ln of that temperature, or ln of the K constant, one over T, so one over the temperature that you have there. You tabulate these values, and you make a plot of ln K, so these values versus one over T, so 
these values. And that will give you another straight line, well, straight line, so it should be, have a negative slope. And then if it has a positive slope, don't fear, please just grind through the math, just continue on. And then you can take it that that slope is equal to minus activation energy over R. In other words, the activation energy is minus R times the slope of your graph. Then you get the activation energy for your reaction. How cool is that? From that, from the reaction for, from the activation energy, we can determine the enthalpy using this equation, 2.26. Um, so the activation energy is equal to RT plus delta H uh, standardized. So standardized meaning what is the temperature, standard temperature and pressure. Um, so standard in Kelvin would be the, the one at 25 degrees Celsius. What is the Kelvin temperature for that? Plug it in there. You know what the gas constant is. Take it over, calculate delta H. Then I don't know what's going on there though. Oh, that's interesting. But we're too far along in this video for us to stop now. And then we're going to use equation 2.23 to calculate delta S, so the change in entropy for this reaction. And then you can use the Boltz, where you, this is the Boltzmann constant, this is the Planck constant. All these things are, of course, listed in your fact manual as well, but I'm just guiding you through the process. And you plug in your delta H that you've just calculated, your R and your T. Again, T is still the same thing. We're at 25 degrees Celsius, but you work in Kelvin. And you get delta S. Then finally, you can calculate the Gibbs free energy using delta H minus T delta S, which is actually something we will look at in theme three. Uh, yes, that's theme three um, on how to derive this expression from first principles. But for now, you can just use it. And then you've calculated the Gibbs free energy, the entropy, the enthalpy, activation energy. You determine the rate constants at each temperature, as well as the order of the reaction. So they've actually calculated everything for this reaction. Okay, good. Now, the next section that you'll do after this, after the results section is your discussion section. And usually we like to keep this between one and 1.5 pages. Don't worry if you can't get to 1.5 pages or even a page, try your best. Just discuss, but don't become, don't repeat yourself. Discuss what needs to be discussed and close it off. Um, we know your writing skills aren't yet at the stage where you can elaborate a lot. Um, but in general, please just, please don't go over a page and a half. That's more what we're trying to say here. Essentially what you're doing in the discussion section is you're bringing everything that you've done now together discussing each little little thing that worried you. If you have OCD, then this section is your favorite section because you're discussing every little aspect that bothered you, thing that you spend time on, anything that you want to discuss, how your aim of your experiment was met, how well your data fit your hypothesis, um, what you found, how you plan to better this, is this was this experimental procedure done well enough? Did you follow the right procedures? What would you recommend in future? That kind of thing. It's sort of like a, a touching base afterwards. It's the afterwards discussion. What did, what did we do wrong? What happened? Everything and in a lengthy discussion um, for someone to read now at length exactly what has gone wrong. Of course, it's always written in paragraph form, not bulleted form. Um, also, the significance of what has been, been determined, that's always important. Why is this important? To look up something about persulfate and iodine. Uh, maybe it's got to do something, I don't know. You should be able to find a few applications quite quickly. Um, and then the final paragraph, so meaning you might have six paragraphs or five paragraphs. The final one should always be in a conclusion. So you can even write, in conclusion, da 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 da. Um, you can have that. Um, usually there aren't really any schemes or figures or whatever located in the discussion section, unless you want to have something that summarizes a few core ideas, like a flow diagram might be very nice to say, this is what our aim was, this is what we found, this is how well it fits the hypothesis, um, this is how everything fits, or this is the workflow, or this is the future work. 
be creative. It's open for interpretation, but also you don't have to include a figure or a diagram or a scheme. That is just for people who really want to invest um, in themselves. Um, and also you can use the discussion questions as a, as a guide of what should be included in your discussion section. Speaking of the discussion questions, um, some hints for them. If we look at the first one, the half-life is the time of the reaction lasts so that the concentration of the reaction's actants decrease by half. Derive an expression for T half in terms of B and K of T. So remember, K of T is just another way of writing just K um, for the halving of uh, under the conditions, conditions of the reaction as carried out in the experiment. T remains constant. So I say start with equation 2.13. So go look at equation 2.13 and think what substitutions you need to make. So what is going to be halved if B remains constant? Um, essentially plug that into the equation and just grind through the mathematics and see what you end up with. And then for number two, now it says calculate the value for the half-life of this reaction carried out at 25 degrees Celsius. So now use your expression you've just obtained to calculate um, T a half and also gives you the temperature so, uh, for the specific. So it's just because we need to do it at a specific temperature because our rate, my apologies, our rate constant is always a function of only temperature. That's a general, that's a rule of law that you can quote me on. Your rate constant is only dependent on temperature. Nothing else. It's a function of temperature only. If you can change whatever you would like, your rate constant is not going to change. Uh, your temperature, your, only your temperature influences your rate constant. Then finally, your reference section. Remember to use the Royal Society of Chemistry citation style. You can use Mendeley. Uh, which will do it automatically for you. But if you prefer to do it by hand, remember the practical guide has a list of examples on how to use, how to cite each type of source that you might use. Please use the library and free access to gather some good scientific data. Please always credit any source that you use outside of your own creative mind. And that is essentially all from me. Uh, good luck and thank you for watching.